How's it going guys? Welcome back to the channel. We're going to be doing a little bit of a history lesson uh, learning reaction today. We're going to find out why all of Denmark's Jews survived the Holocaust. That's right. We're going to do some World War II stuff right here. Now this is a priority request from Dolly. So shout out to you. Uh, huge thanks for the video. If you want to make your own priority request or just support the channel in any way, there is links in the description section down below. And if you donate like uh, $10 or more, you get a priority request as a thank you uh, from me to you know for supporting the channel, which is always great. And if you don't want to do that, just hit like, drop a comment, something like that. It always helps for sure, for sure. So anyways, we're going to find out right here. Let me get it where you can see it. There we go. Why almost all of Denmark's Jews survived the Holocaust and the original channel is Imperial War Museums. So I'm going to hit like in the video. I'll subscribe later if I enjoy the content. And there will be a link to the original video in the description section down below, as always. And we're going to go ahead and jump into this and find out what we can find out. It was the evening of October 1st, 1943, when German police and members of the Danish SS descended on Copenhagen with orders to round up and deport Denmark's Jewish population. It was the night of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and the German police were expecting to find Jewish families at home celebrating. Okay. What they found instead was empty house after empty house. Someone, yeah, somebody tipped him off, had tipped off the Jewish community. Oh, wow. Exact wording that he used, too. <laughs> awesome. By the end of the war, over 95% of Denmark's nearly 8,000 Jews would escape Denmark and avoid becoming victims of the Holocaust. This survival rate is extraordinary. Unfortunately, this was not the case across the rest of Nazi-occupied Europe. Oh, wow. To find out why, we need to go back to 1940. Okay. Six months into the Second World War, Germany invaded Denmark and Norway. Whilst Norway would hold out for another two months, Denmark surrendered immediately. This decision avoided any unnecessary death and destruction and allowed Denmark's sovereignty to remain intact. Well, and Denmark borders Germany too, so it would have been a little bit harder for them to really fight it off. I mean, Denmark's a small country compared to Germany, and I'm assuming the German army was was way more massive. I mean, they had a, a, a massive army in World War II, right? Also, um, if any of you guys, I know it's a little unlikely because of, of how long ago it's been, but if any of you guys actually was alive during this, I can't relate. I mean, I, I feel bad for you, and, and I'm glad you guys survived. This is a very, very, very sad, dark time in history, guys. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to try to stay serious. I'm not, you know, sometimes I get off topic and I, and I crack jokes and stuff, but this isn't the video for that. So I'm going to try my best to to just just be positive and, and, and learn. Unlike German occupation policy elsewhere in Europe, at first their rule in Denmark was relatively benign. This was necessary because Denmark exported a lot of essential supplies to Germany, especially food. They also saw Danes as fellow proper Aryans. This model of occupation, or the model protectorate, meant that Denmark could keep its entire government, police and civil service. There were also minimal restrictions on ordinary people, unlike in the rest of Nazi-occupied Europe. This also applied to Denmark's almost 8,000 Jews, a tiny proportion of Denmark's population of 4 million people. So did they just say it also applied to the Danish Jews? So the Danish Jews weren't... I got to go back and hear that again, because I think it said that the Danish Jews had somewhat of freedom. Minimal restrictions on ordinary people. Yeah, minimal restrictions on ordinary people, which is, is unheard of for World War II, which I, I, I admit, I don't know hardly anything about World War II at all. Almost non-existent knowledge of it, to be honest with you. I know you, you're judging me right now, and that's fine. But I'm trying to learn, guys. I'm trying. Unlike in the rest of Nazi-occupied Europe, this also applied to Denmark's almost 8,000 Jews, a tiny proportion of Denmark's population of 4 million people. Danish Jews were very assimilated into Danish society, although there was still some anti-Semitism. King Christian X and the Danish government had made it known that they would continue to cooperate with Germany only so long as the Nazis did not introduce any anti-Jewish legislation. In fact, the king wrote in his diary that he, quote, considered our own Jews to be Danish citizens and the Germans could not touch them. 
Okay. However, this policy of protection for the Jews would not last forever. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen that coming, but yeah, way to go for the Danes, man. Like, that's, that's, it, it, don't give in, you know? It's like, no, these, these are part of our population. Like, leave them alone. Like, that's, hell yeah, hoorah for the Danes. In mid-1943, the relationship between the Danish people and its German occupiers began to change. As Germany suffered more and more military setbacks, the Danish population began to more actively resist German control. Demonstrations and mass strikes took place and acts of sabotage by the Danish resistance intensified. In August, the Danish government resigned and the German military commander declared martial law. Over late August and September, there were a couple of incidents that sparked fear throughout the Danish-Jewish population. In one incident, the premises belonging to the Jewish community were searched by the Gestapo for lists, indexes, books, family trees, anything that would help the Germans to identify Danish Jews, since, unlike in other countries, they had not been forced to register with authorities, made to wear a yellow star, or carry identity cards marked with the letter J. Now that the Germans were no longer pursuing a policy of active cooperation, their rule became much more repressive. On September 8, the Nazi civil administrator in Denmark, Werner Best, wrote to Berlin suggesting a solution to the Jewish question must now be considered. A week later, Hitler issued the order, and preparations were made for the imminent deportation of Danish Jews. The where did they send them, though? Like, where, where would they, I mean, made to concentration camps, I guess? Nazis planned to make the arrest on the night of October 1st. Crucially, this was after trade negotiations had been completed, which guaranteed Danish supplies to the Reich for the coming year. But it was also the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Okay, yeah, I've heard of Rosh Hashanah and all that stuff. I don't really honestly know much about it, guys. Um, I've been pretty closed off here in America, and not going to lie, I mean, prior to, to, to starting my channel and everything, I didn't really know anything about the, the world, and, and I still really don't. But, uh, you know, th that's why we're doing this learning journey together. Right? It's not just reactions, we're learning. It's like a learning vlog style reaction kind of thing. Fortunately, the Danish Jews were about to receive a life-saving warning. George Ferdinand de Quitz worked at the German embassy in Denmark and had been told of the plan by Werner Best. Upon hearing of the planned deportations, he tipped off a number of local politicians, one of whom alerted a prominent figure within the Jewish community. On the 29th of September 1943, at a service that marks the start of Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Marcus Melchior warned those present in the synagogue not to be at home over the next few days. This warning was passed on by both Jewish and non-Jewish Danish citizens and gave the Danish Jews a vital head start. Nice, so even the non-Jews are like, you know what, we gotta let these guys know, like this ain't right, we gotta let them know so they can dip out of the country or go into a, a safe spot somewhere. Very cool, very commemorable. Yeah. Allowing them time to pack a few belongings, go into hiding and make preparations to leave Denmark. So, on the 1st of October, when German police and Danish SS volunteers knocked on the doors of Danish Jews, they found that the majority were not there. Unlike elsewhere... Hold on, did that say Danish police? So, so, oh, because the Danes are cooperating with the Germans, so... That means the police force has to do what the Germans order them to do? Let me go back and listen to that part again. Uh. So, on the 1st of October, when German police and Danish SS volunteers knocked... Okay, German police, my bad, but also Danish SS volunteers. So SS was was the Nazi super soldiers, right? I didn't know that there was anybody that wasn't German that was part of that. So that's news to me. Um, so Danish SS volunteers. Knocked on the doors of Danish Jews. They found that the majority were not there. Unlike elsewhere in Western Europe, the Nazis were specifically ordered not to force their way into homes or damage property. This meant that the Germans were only able to make around 500 arrests. Very interesting how they just held the Danes in such high regard. Like, they, they're like, you know what? They don't want us to damage property and force their way. You know, we don't want them to force their way and we're not going to. Like, that's very interesting. This included elderly Jews who had been unable to flee and those in the provinces who hadn't been alerted to the danger. The other 7,000 Danish Jews were already in hiding, 
with friends, neighbours, sometimes even strangers, and preparing to flee to nearby Sweden. Almost all of Okay, yeah, I was actually wondering earlier because it said that they that a lot of them fled the country and I was actually, I didn't mention it at the time in the video, but in the back of my mind, I was wondering like, where, where did they go? So Sweden, very cool. Denmark's Jews were concentrated in Copenhagen, just 20 miles away from Sweden, significantly reducing the time and risk required to escape. Okay. Now all they needed was a way to get to Sweden, which was separated from Denmark by a stretch of water called the Orisund. On the 2nd of October, Sweden formally broadcast a message offering to accept all Danish Jews and their non-Jewish relatives who could reach Sweden. Cool. This announcement gave the green light to those in hiding, who now knew they would be safe if they could find a way across the Orisund. But whilst nice. the majority of Denmark's Jews began to plan their escape over to Sweden, those that didn't make it into hiding in time began to be deported. 456 of the 476 Jews who had been arrested were transported to Germany. Then, mostly in cattle wagons, like the one behind me, were sent to the ghetto in Terezin, which the Nazis renamed Theresienstadt. Theresienstadt is around 60 kilometers north of Prague in what was then Czechoslovakia. The ghetto was created initially for Czech Jews. Later, elderly Jews and those seen as privileged were sent there from Germany and Austria. Now I said in what was then Czechoslovakia, so is that not Czechoslovakia now? Is that is that now part of modern day Germany, guys? Um, let me know if you know. Let me know down below. The Nazis would attempt to deceive the world that Jews in Theresienstadt could live a normal life, which led to the ghetto gaining some amenities which were quite unusual for a ghetto. For example, there was a bank in Theresienstadt which issued money and savings books. In reality, any money or savings were worthless. So, so is this so this concentration camp was specifically for the Danes and they like the Danish Jews and and they got better treatment? And that's all because the Germans thought of the Nazi or the Germans thought of the Danes as pure-blooded Aryan race people also? Am I missing something? Is that is that correct or fill me in guys, fill me in cuz I you know, it's it's a lot. It's it's a lot to to figure out, especially not you know jumping into it, not really knowing anything about World War II, and I'm excited that Dolly gave me this one for a priority request actually, um, and and it might be because well obviously I mean she's 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 Danish she lives in the Netherlands now but uh part of it might be because a few uh, a couple months back or something like that I was I, I I was mentioning something about how I would like to explore more about World War II history and everything so this is kind of tying in World War II history some Danish history and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, very, very cool. Cultural life also flourished. Artwork was produced, music was composed, operas were written and performed, and lectures were delivered. Really? Something that the Germans capitalized on for propaganda purposes. Hmm. The conditions the captured Danish Jews would experience upon their arrival in Theresian stat were atrocious. Death rates were high in the ghetto, particularly amongst the elderly who were so even though they they had more anemones than other concentration camps it was still it was still a concentration camp right like it was it was still pretty terrible and and everything so it's just crazy how they have they had like different outlook on like the Danish Jews than they did the rest of the Jews. It's very interesting. We're especially vulnerable to the dire overcrowding, starvation, and disease. Back in Denmark, the majority of Danish Jews fled to coastal towns and ports in the Zealand. Local non-Jewish people offered shelter, and in some cases, they helped to secure transport on fishing boats. In the first week or so, before any organized help was coordinated, some Danish Jews sought local fishermen and skippers to take them across to Sweden they would often request huge sums of money for the journey. This was mostly due to fears of being caught and losing their livelihood, though some simply saw an opportunity to make a profit. There's always going to be people like that. That's just, you know, some of them are trying to help. Yes, for sure. But others are just like, okay, let's get that money. There's, there's going to always be some greedy, money-hungry people involved somewhere. No surprise there. Within the first 48 hours, around 500 Jews had left Denmark and reached safety in Sweden, largely those who could afford these high prices. Resistance groups soon coordinated and they organized transports across the Orisund. 
So how many of them remained in Sweden to this day? Do you guys, like, if any guys are watching, are you guys descended from the Danish Jews that escaped and fled to Sweden and remained in Sweden, and now you guys are like a Swedish kind of, uh, you know, you have, like, Swedish culture and stuff? Um, that'd be interesting to know. They negotiated standard fares and raised funds for those who did not have enough money to make the journey. Nice. By the 9th of October, approximately 4,500 Jews from Denmark had reached Sweden. Jeez. And by mid-October, around 7,200 had made it to safety, okay. a total of 95% of Denmark's Jewish population. Part of the reason boats and ships were able to successfully cross the Öresund was because Danish and German coastal patrols did not intervene. In part, this was because Werner Best had one eye on maintaining a peaceful occupation and avoiding any increase in anti-German sentiment. Very cool. So they're just kind of like letting it happen because they so so they're working with the Germans somewhat, but at the same time, behind the Germans' back, they're like, "Hey, we didn't see nothing, guys. Hurry up, <laughs> get across the river or get across that waterway. Not not a river, but whatever kind of waterway it is." But none of the Danish were aware of this. For the Danish Jews who were escaping and those helping them, the journey was full of fear, tension and anxiety. Those who acted to help assist in the rescue did so boldly and in the face of the unknown. In November, it was agreed that the Jews who had been deported from Denmark would remain in Theresienstadt, and the Germans would also reluctantly allow the Danish Red Cross to conduct a visit and inspect the conditions of the ghetto but made sure this visit wouldn't take place until after they'd had enough time to create a false narrative. It's interesting that they let the Danish people come in and see how exactly it's going. But of course, you know, they're like, oh, well, let's, let's dress it up, make it appear a certain way that it's really not ahead of time. But uh, very interesting how the, Jew, the, the Germans held the Danes in such high regard. That's, I never knew that before today, that, that's crazy. In the lead up to this visit, Theresienstadt underwent intense renovations in order to present the ghetto as a model Jewish settlement. This work was done by the prisoners who were forced to build a swimming pool, plant gardens, construct parks, renovate barracks and plan cultural events. Over 7,000 people were deported, primarily to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Okay, so that's definitely... Well, no, because Vienna is part of Austria. I was going to say I thought that was definitely part of Germany now. Terrainistat. I'm going to check that out real quick. How do you spell that? I'm sorry, guys. T E R S I E N. Okay, so the Trianstadt ghetto was established by the SS during World War II in the fortress town of Terezin. So Terezin, in the pro protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. So Terezin, is that... Okay, so that is still, that is the Czech Republic right now. So it's not even in Germany. Plan cultural events. Over 7,000 people were deported, primarily to Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the weeks before the Red Cross visit, so that the ghetto looked less overcrowded. Danish prisoners were also temporarily moved to slightly better accommodation and were allowed to stay together as families. When they arrived, Red Cross officials were shown a performance of a children's opera and a football match. The work that had been done succeeded in fooling the Danish Red Cross officials, who reported that the conditions, health, clothing and accommodation were satisfactory. In reality, over 30,000 Jews would die in Theresienstadt, yes. and nearly 90,000 were deported to Nazi death camps yes, where they were murdered. Not long after the visit, deportations resumed. Tens of thousands were deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau and their names recorded on transport lists. This transport list shows some of the names of the 2,503 men, women and children who were deported from Theresienstadt on the 18th of December 1943. They arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau the next day. Because of the agreement with the Germans, Danish Jews were not deported from the ghetto and remained in the ghetto until April 1945. At which point, the remaining Danish Jews were transported to Sweden by the Danish, Norwegian and Swedish Red Cross. 
Why were they? Why was the Danish Jews deported to Sweden? So was this at the end? So 1945 was that was the end of World War II, right? Why didn't they just go back to Denmark? After the liberation of Denmark in May 1945, most Jews were able to return to the homes that they had been forced to abandon in 1943. Okay. 51 Danish Jews died in Theresienstadt, and a further 50 or so more died trying to escape to Sweden, or in Sweden itself. This number represents one of the lowest death rates of Jews in any German-occupied European country during the Second World War. Over 95% of Danish Jews survived the Holocaust. It's an extraordinary statistic, made possible by Denmark's unique set of circumstances during the war. But this was the minority experience. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, the rest of Europe didn't get so lucky, that's for sure. Thirds of Europe's Jewish population would not survive the Second World War. Oh, wow. Two thirds did not survive. So only one third of the Jewish population survived. That is insane to me. And it seems like the majority of that was Danish Jews. Wow. Well, anyways, that was an amazing video. Um, if you guys, uh, you know, have any links or anything like that for anything similar, I do have a video suggestion um, area on Discord. I can't get around to doing them all, but I do try to go through them and, and pick out some good ones. And if you want a priority request, like I said, there is links in the description section down below. If you support the channel with a donation of $10 or more, then as a, as a thank you to you, uh, you get a priority request. And I usually try to get those uploaded and posted within two weeks of... Um, of it being there so and that's just to to account for like life situations sometimes i can't get around to videos right away full-time dad and stuff like that and you know my girlfriend's working all the time she's actually at work right now but uh yeah very cool very interesting um i want to check out more of this actually so uh yeah you guys have a super fun awesome day and i will catch you in the next one all right take care bye